In this episode of the Neil Wilkins podcast, I'm delighted to welcome Matt Tack. Matt is the co-host of the Full Fueled podcast uh, with Dr. Alfred Alessi. Um, on their show, which is powered by Nutritious, um, they champion the forever athlete and talk about six key pillars, which I want to go into here, which are fuel, movement, sleep, mind, work, and spirit. So a lot of key ingredients for a very healthy, very full-fueled lifestyle. So welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks, Neil. Uh, definitely a pleasure. Looking forward to chatting with you. Yeah, this is some um, interesting times for you as well, because you are in the midst of hurricane season right now. How have, have things sort of been your side? You know, what? it's funny is that so my family spends uh, we're in Tampa, Florida, but my family spends uh, the summers up in Michigan. And so I actually went and picked them up and we're trying to navigate this as the storm started setting in and kind of rolling up. Uh, and so you never know, like being from Michigan, when snow comes down, everyone kind of stays indoors. But, you know, I call it the winter season of Florida when hurricane season's rolling through. And so we're in Michigan looking at the storm in Florida. We really, should we go back down? Should we not? So anyways, we made the journey uh, southward uh, yesterday and uh, it was, it was a pretty, it was a, it was a good storm. Uh, we were rolling through and uh, there, it, there definitely was a lot of wind and um, ton of rain. It is just dumping down right now. So it, I had to kind of make a, make a makeshift podcast studio really quick. Uh, just to even get away for a little bit of the rain and the noise, but we're safe. And yeah, it's a busy season here. Uh, it, you know, for the next couple months, uh, in Florida, it's, it's just, uh, we, you know, we, we accept it and it's hurricane season. <laughs> mm, I love the way where somebody says, oh yeah, it's a good one. You know, you just kind of think, yeah, we're accepting of this thing because what, well, what can you do? It is what it is right now. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, some of these uh, storm seasons now are becoming ever more dramatic, aren't they? Ever more um, intense. And I think um, that's probably just life in general as well, isn't it? Really? There's a lot of chaos, noise, uncertainty, fear. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in the world. How are, how are you kind of navigating it with this whole idea of, you know, the forever athlete, this kind of whole kind of, I guess, mental well-being, physical well-being, just being in a good place? Because the world needs this right now, doesn't it? Yeah, such a phenomenal question, you know, and that's even kind of the concept of where things started for me and kind of like the journey of my story is, People typically, you know, after maybe high school athletics, you know, start having kids and just life gets busy. And then the seasonality of the next thing, right? We're just always drawn to the next thing. But really, you know, I, I always looked at from the macro level with just a, just mental illness happening uh, in just these young adolescent kids. And then now even in, you know, you, you even look at parents that are managing these kids, they have a mental health crisis as well, right? Uh, in their 30s and then in their 40s. And it's just this game, this social game that we're playing. But the reality is, is there's there's one thing that really truly fixes that over and over and over time. If you are, if you define kind of how your body is operating every day, and you unload and just go in with a level of discomfort, a lot of those things do go away. Now, I'm not saying everything would go away, but a lot of it does go away with just movement, right? When the body moves, the mind grooves. And so how are we moving our mind so much? And, you know, then it becomes like this forever athlete concept. I think everyone, literally everyone has their own athlete within them um, and they just have to pull it out, whatever it is, right? You know, so many people say, ah, I'm not athletic or that's not for me. But the reality is, is that just we have that drive. It's that competitive force that kind of drives us to just be a little bit better every day. And so that's really the concept of, you know, my failures, as I would say, and I, I wouldn't call them failures anymore, but as like this really, really good uh, high school athlete um, that probably should have gone collegiate and just I I, I felt like I was lazy and I, I gave up on things. And th that ultimately led to me pushing fitness away, pushing just athletics away for a few years. Um, and then fully coming back to that and saying, actually, I think my best days are always ahead of me. 
And that shift in that mindset of our best days are always ahead of us. I want to be a little bit, you know, I want to be competitive. I want to step into every day with a level of fortitude that I can also display to my children because I have three girls now. Um, and I want to show them that, hey, like it's not I'm not just trying to live through you. I'm actually trying to keep my body in shape. I'm also trying to keep my business in shape. I'm trying to keep my mindset in shape. And I'm also I have this super healthy marriage. And so all these things kind of come full circle, but you really have to intentionally follow that level of discomfort. And that's where really that fitness element comes into play. When you can intentionally step into that layer of discomfort, uh, as Jim Quick always says, you know, when the body moves, the mind grooves. Um, and so that intentionality really is where the formulation of your four hour, forever athlete happens. You know, there's so many people that didn't play high school athletics, maybe didn't even play collegiate athletics, but man, I love running right? I call you, that's an athlete. You're an athlete. And so how do you just get a little bit better at that every day? And so that's the concept of this forever athlete is just like um, stepping into a layer of discomfort and just getting a little bit better every day. I mean, it's, it's almost ironic or is it blessed that we're actually having this conversation right in the middle of the Olympics? Because I think when people talk about athletes, you know, we're often kind of just in our minds, I guess, drawn to that higher kind of echelon of, you know, the medal winners. Nobody talks about everybody else who's competing. It's always about in the media. It's all about, you know, did you win gold, silver or bronze? Oh, you only got a silver, you know, and it's just kind of like, no, it's actually, as you're saying there, Matt, it's it's everybody. If you mm. choose to be an athlete, maybe with a lower case A, so yeah, you might not be pushing for gold at the Olympics. And by the way, the US, I think, are coming through, aren't they? I'm that leaderboard they're starting yeah. to get there i think uh, they might actually do it um but it's interesting isn't it there's something in this for all of us it's not the 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 kind of reserved um area just for those who are physically blessed or maybe you know have that extra kind of drive and passion it's for everybody this isn't it yeah it really is i mean so many and i think this this goes back to even something else as far as how and i've been I've been so this is something I'm like we even working on myself and continually work on every day, but the power of how I vocalize words to myself. And so there's so many people that say I'm not good at running. And I'm like that you, when you flip the script and you're saying, I'm just getting a little bit better at running every day, right? And that that is the improvement of the athlete concept of like that forever athlete. Of, hey, I'm, I'm just improving. I'm getting a little bit better every day, right? I might not be a super fast runner, but I'm getting a little bit better every day. And that is where you just kind of fall into the love and it really what truly an athlete is. And some of the best athletes in the world will tell you, I fell in love with the process. That's it. I just fell in love with the process of it all. Um, I listened to a podcast last night with Marion Jones. She was a five time um, gold. I don't think gold medal, but five medal winner. I think she won like two or three golds. She was stripped of her title. She was actually incarcerated uh, because in the second Olympics she went into, uh, she lied about it, essentially a doping scandal. Um, and she didn't know she was taking it. She had coaches around that were basically saying, hey, this is what you need to take. But the reality is, it was a really cool story uh, just to kind of rabbit trail just a little bit, but it was a really cool story because she was raising an infant child and she was saying, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Yet she told the media that she didn't use that drug and it came out where she was using the drug and uh, she was like, I can't tell my child this and then still expect to to, to, for for me not to do it. And so she kind of reverted that. And um, so where I was going at with the point of that story, though, with Marion Jones is that she loved track and field so much that she just enjoyed it was the process of it all. It was the training that she was into um, that she talks about just like absolutely like loving that entire process. And so why is that any different from somebody that isn't a gold medal winner, though? How are you going into every day of just like enjoying that process so much where you're just like, hey, I'm going to I'm going to dig into this, the level of discomfort. And, you know, honestly, we have to be we have to be truthful to ourselves. Some days we aren't going to enjoy it. Like some days we're going to be like, man, this is super shitty. Like, you know, and we just got to be super and raw and honest. Um, but I'm going to do it anyway. 
and and then tomorrow you know i might have a little bit better of it you know a grateful heart to like dig into this every day that i go to the gym I, i'll tell you what like my wife thinks i love going to the gym and i'm like you know some days yeah it is a great reprieve i had a lot of stress i just got a lot of stress off me um but then there's other days where no i'm just like that's that's part of the process uh and i always go back to james clear's quote you don't rise to the level of your goals you fall to the level of your systems and so what are the systems that are we putting in as a daily practice practice for the purposes of longevity um and that's you know ultimately what i go back to is can i can i really more and more every day can i fall in love with that process that makes me win my version of gold right and so that's really i think really what it comes down to and that was a super cool podcast with Dak shepherd and marion jones if you haven't heard of it listen to it that was a good one Mm, we'll, we'll track that down and put the link into the uh, into the notes here because I'm sure lots of people will be interested in that one. Uh, yeah, the, these backstories where you can kind of really identify with the athlete and sort of think, oh, if that was me. Yeah, you can kind of see those similarities. They're always, you know, so, so powerful, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I'm interested in going into these six pillars. You, you talk a lot, I know, about the um, the balance of these pillars and actually how they're the kind of almost the, the building blocks of getting this right kind of, I guess, sort of attitude so that if you are not necessarily feeling it in terms of the run or the gym um, visit or whatever on a particular day, they, they almost they give you that fallback state that it's like, well, I have to continue to do it because I'm going to then be out of balance if I don't. Is, is, is that the real reason behind having these these six pillars? Because they are pretty holistic. I mean, there's nothing uncovered there, is there? Everything is covered in this mix. Yeah, that's a great question. When we when we made kind of the evolution of those pillars, we just wanted to kind of give it parameters, the parameters of life. Uh, and then what is like the necessities of it all? And so like as you program in, um, it's not anyone is dialed at every time. You know what I mean? Like you want majority of them ebbing and flowing and you want to be in a cadence and a rhythm. But to expect to be like every single one, it's, you know, life comes, you know, and, and uh, as Mike Tyson always says, everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the face. And so then what's the plan when you're when you're getting back up? And so these six pillars, as far as like, what are the systems that are loaded into every one of them? Right. And so there there might be a small piece of whatever it is like when your nutrition fuel work what, what are those small pieces that give you a cadence um but then you know expectations are also huge and so i'm in a very big expectation season with my family and my wife right now so work's a little bit busy i'm also in like that training piece i had a goal for myself this year so i'm like doing a lot of training so nutrition and fuel are super super important i gotta be i'm not eating a lot of meals with them that are that they eat i actually have to eat my own meals um and so all these things like come into play now i was reading a book i actually met the author i went to his book launch uh, marcus callius and he talks about the burners right creating burners in life and you know sometimes you need to heat one up but then you need the expectations that this one's gonna fall a little bit and so that's where I see the pillars come into play is that, you know, they're there, right? The expectations are that they're, they're all there and I want to cadence with all of them. Um, however, one of them, I might have to choose that I'm going on a real big burner, right? I'm going to turn that burner on and that burner is going to heat up for a little bit, but then what is the expectations of where it is and then where do I want it to go? Um, so, that I know this happens with the seasonality of work and people like always try to figure out like what, how, how can I do this and then raise a family and then, um, you know, and then feel like I'm involved in, you know, my spiritual life. And then I'm still doing this, you know, I'm still fitness. And then you, you try to like do eight different things at once and it, it doesn't, and nothing, nothing adds up and makes sense. And then you're like, screw this. I'm not going to do it. So then it's really just evaluating those seasons of work, but then also realizing that that is not the end all be all. Like there's got to be a season at which like you plateau. And so that's something that John Maxwell talks about quite a bit is that there's like there's this level of growth 
but then there's the expectation that there's a plateau season. Well, the plateau season is meant for reflection and for growth um, in that. And so as we visualize these pillars, it's like, where's the season of where we can turn the burner on? It's a little bit hotter. I'm running. It could be as long as a year. It might be six months. It might be eight months. It might be two weeks. But like, what are the expectations of that burner is going to be on 100, you know, 32 degrees or whatever it is um, to really churn to then evaluate? All right. What what seasonality of um, life am I in now? And for me, you know, I like I can't make a sacrifice for my children, my children's it's they're super important right now in that shaping and forming of their mind so i knew the expectations were i you know might be dialed back just a little bit in business um where i'm not going to be able to accelerate the way i want to because the, because of what my motive is right now and where my burner's at so though that's mainly um kind of keeping the parameters and the pillars in place of really getting an understanding of when you turn on that burner and then w when maybe when you dial that burner back. I hope that makes sense. Mm, I love the practicality of that. And I think there's a really nice kind of way that kind of almost feels like you're in control. So it's it's OK to to dial something back because either physically you've got an injury or you're just not feeling right. And, you know, for some of us, you know, hormonal times of the year. Um, or if somebody is going through, say, menopause or something like that. And so there are these, these moments in life where, you know, certain, certain things almost, you could argue, beyond your control are going to be impacting on those expectations. I love that word expectation because it is something that you've got control over dialing up or dialing down. So as you say, you can turn the analogy of turning that burner down is just great. It doesn't mean you're switching it off. It doesn't mean you have to stop, but you can just kind of temper its enthusiasm, should we say, if something else is coming in that you really can't control. I love that. That's, that's a really nice way of yeah, just always kind of saying, I'm in charge of this goal setting. And if things need to move, and particularly if you're working with, you know, with children and their timeline is, you know, that's possibly a one time thing, whereas you could turn up the burners later, but the children are never going to be that age or at that stage. And if you miss it, you missed it. It's, it's one of those things, isn't it? There are certain key points in life where other things actually will take a priority for the right reasons. Because that's important to keep that mix and almost that awareness of kind of what are the externalities that are affecting me right now. And if I can be very mindful of those, then I'll stay in control. But actually, it, it will feel right as well, because that's important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That it feels like you're still making progress, but actually not going too hard and too fast to the detriment of other things. Yeah, so good, Neil. Uh, you know, one thing you said that's really important and honestly this didn't come to my realization like it was almost an epiphany when i was getting coached but we're all we're all chasing a feeling like it we're chasing a feeling regardless every day we're chasing some feeling no matter what we enter into what the choice is it's the feeling of where we're associated so it's like my coach was saying, oh, yeah, you want a fit body, right? You want a fit body. You actually don't want a fit body. You want the feeling that that fit body gives you, right? And so it all gives the emotion and the feeling that's tied behind to it. And so that's what we're chasing. And then for me, I really had to look at it as reverse engineering, like almost my 85-year-old self. Like I had to really feel like put, putting my mind in my 85-year-old self's shoes my girls are in their like 50s and 60s at that point. Um, and then what are they talking about of when was dad there when they were four to 10 years old, where it was, you know, did we have memories? What what what, what did that look like? Um, because at that time, I'm probably relatively irrelevant or or I, like my the 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 way my mind works is a lot different at 85. Right. than than right now. So like, then what am I protecting as like the sacred piece? Um, and then what feelings do I want to experience at 85? Right. Uh, that's It's going to be a ton of reflection of life and um, just a ton of just hopefully euphoria and momentum uh, with with my children. And so look, what, what do I want Christmas to feel like all those? So these feelings like you can you can spur those up and 
that's kind of the superpower of nostalgia too, right? Is like taking that ability of to reflect and really stir up those emotions so that you can propel things forward more aggressively. But anyways, that's kind of like where my mind has been gone, gone a little lately as far as like stirring up the emotions because we are all chasing a feeling. Um, and then what do I want that feeling to be? And for me, um, it was last year, you know, just from a fitness element, I do have goals from just a naturally just to, to, to be fit. And so last year I focused on really high cardiovascular release. And so I was very dialed in in my cardiovascular um, and did that, uh, lost a decent amount of muscle mass. And I'm like, you know what, this year I'm going to shift that up a little bit because I felt like my frame was a little too skinny. And so I've shifted that up and dialed that in and, and packed down some significant weight in terms of muscle mass. Um, that was a goal of mine. But again, it was the, the two feelings associated. What was I going after at that time? And I really had to be cognizant of that. And then ultimately, you know, I, I did turn that burner a little hot and I still am. Um, is it at the detriment of anything else? And so I'm constantly evaluating because that is ultimately going to give me a feeling, that feeling of regret. Um, and if I don't take time to reflect and associate like, hey, what's wh what are the what are the you know, what are the accelerators here that I really need to focus on um, are really important. So that's I love the idea and the concept of that. You know, we are, we are always chasing a feeling of some sort. Um, and uh, we can be we can be present with it, too. So like that feeling of anxiety, I've been trying to yeah, that's a big thing in today's society of like just anxiety. And a lot of times I'm like, well, when the anxiety overcomes me, like what is my next step? Like, what am I trying to get to? And being present for with the anxiety and just being able to breathe and being mindful through that of like, oh, what's what's it here for? What's what's it giving me? What can I learn from it? Um, that gives me a new concept of kind of flipping the script and and retraining the brain in terms of like how I associate anxiety, sadness, grief, happiness, love, joy, all those things. Of course, we want to be more often in the place of happiness, love and joy. Um, but there's also that times where we, we go through uh, the anxiety, the depression and how are we just present with those? And so that's really what just being full rounded and, and, and encompassing um, the pillars um, that we have has really helped me kind of uh, create and guide me in terms of uh, uh, just dealing with emotions and getting to the next feeling. And that reverse engineering back from that kind of desired or expected feeling feels a really healthy way of approaching this, certainly from you know, the way you're describing it, Matt, because I guess a lot of people are almost caught in that loop of the other person they see on the machine next to them in the gym is like, oh, I want to be like that. I want to look like that. Or social media. Obviously, there's so much hype in terms of a certain look or mm -hmm. a certain demographic. And you need to have this kind of lifestyle and you need to look this way, dress in these kinds of clothes. This whole thing about driven by the feeling, I mean, that might be the feeling that you want, in which case, yeah, pursue it. It's fine. You know, no judgment here. But it also might be something that's very deeply personal to you as an individual. And that's OK, too. This mm -hmm. feels like this is giving permission to be your real self. And it's even almost beyond the athletics, isn't it? It's beyond the physicality. Mm -hmm. It's about being the real you, isn't it, if it's driven by feeling. Yeah, that's so good, Neil. It's uh, it hundred percent is. It's absolutely. It's it. You know, we always want to go back. Like it's, it, you know, even me every day. Like it, th this. It's about me. You know, everyone else is living in my world. It's it's like the that what that just the the mindset and the trickery of like I the, almost like this selfish nature. But that's one of the most beautiful thing about like having these three girls in my life now. Uh, I got an eight, six and four year old and uh, but very quickly they'll remind me that life isn't about me. Right. And that I need to get back to it and I need to be there for them and serve them. And by the grace of God, I have an amazing wife uh, that <laughs> helps us immensely. So uh, shout out to Kelly. She's just like she is that. And I have to go back to that qu actually quite a bit because 
that is also another really, really big piece. Um, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I was actually at a family event um, and I got a couple of people in my family that are just doing incredibly well. They smashed it over the past couple of years um, and it just have done really, really well in their lines of business. Um, but then I was looking at I was looking at one of them um, and he's, you know, like he's I think he's mid 30s at this point. And I asked my wife, I was like, is he uh is is he you think he's gonna get married or anything and because he's just focused on business right and so then i had to like i had to perceive uh, there was no, like no comparison game i was just like had wanted to get, really get an understanding of that and he's absolutely again crushed it um but like that level of the almost loneliness you could say that like you you crushed it but then there's like no one you can really share that with right and so I was I was processing through this a little bit more because the feeling is it like sharing it with somebody like that's an epic feeling when you can share uh, the wins with somebody. And I go back to like kind of the forever athlete concept of life. Right. When you can share that and really like embrace one another and be like, we did this together. And that's how I feel about my wife almost like every day. Right. Like we i'm looking back when we're driving through a hurricane uh with these three little girls asleep in our car and that thought of like we're doing this together comes through my mind and that level of just embrace is like man that's a winning strategy that's like the forever athlete of being a dad you know uh and a mom and all these things so really i don't know if that answers your question but like it's that embracing piece that winning together that elevating one another really kind of brings that like full circle of man it that we get i get to experience that that's the feeling associated with it uh it's it's a pretty cool feeling mm, it is and i can just tell just by the passion with which you're saying it that 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 gets to the core of you doesn't it and that's such a, a motivator isn't it and an inspiration for those days when you get up and you think whoa, today's going to be a tough day or I'm just not feeling it today. If you revert back to that moment and that feeling, it's like, no, I'm actually driven now. So it's a fuel in itself, isn't it, really? Just that constant yeah, knowing, I guess, that this is the right trajectory. This is the right journey. I'm actually doing the right thing, not just for me, but those, as you described it, those I serve as well. So that's it's right. massively powerful. That's good. Yeah, that's mm. exactly it. You're spot on. So the these six six pillars then I, I'm really curious about the six pillars. Now I know obviously there's a, there's a huge amount of detail that we could go into, but just give give the audience a little bit of a I guess a feeling for from your perspective um, how these kind of play out, and then hopefully then we can sort of see how they interlink. The fuel bit. Where, where do we start with that? Because everybody's talking about kind of healthy healthy nutrition, hydration. Are there some sort of top tips of things if you're going to strike this balance across all six pillars? Are there some some really key things that everybody should be following in the, in the fuel piece? Yeah. So fuel, I'll tell you what, that, that's a simple, really simple answer because so many people are deficient in protein. It, you need to get back to protein being your number one thing. And I give you one hack and a tip, right? Think of your ideal body weight, and that's what your protein intake should be every day. Every day, you should have that much protein in uh, coming consuming in your body. So if you want to be 200 pounds, then try to get 200 grams of protein per pound of body weight. Um, if you want to be 180 pounds, if you want to be 110 pounds, whatever that number is, get one gram per body weight um, and make sure you're eating that in protein every day. So one, the one way that I do it is a little bit different. I have like the protein shakes. I think that's a great added way, but like getting lean chicken into your diet, uh, getting, you know, chicken is my absolute go-to, um, in nearly everything, but fuel it's across the board in pretty much all over the country, in, all over the United States, as far as what I see on a day-to-day -day basis, we're just so deficient in protein. It's insane. We do not focus on protein. All these snacks, uh, you know, snacking is a big thing here in the U.S. of just grabbing things that are more carbohydrate and fat filled um, than they are protein. So fuel is necessary and protein is a necessity of life. 
um, and, and, and in particular longevity. So uh, that's one thing that I absolutely fuel. Fuel and protein go hand in hand. Um, but like being able to macro count is a really imperative thing too. Uh, as you understand, you know, macros coming in and macros going out in terms of what your uh, expenditures are going to be, um, that that's important uh, just to just to understand because that is a key metric of longevity. We think of everything, all these pillars, through the lens of longevity, right? Um, not not necessarily what your health spans or your lifespan is going to look like, but what your health span is going to look like. And if you can live optimally, why not, right? And so that's what we always look at that through. And so fuel is a big piece of that, but protein is a major, major component of getting proper protein intake on a daily basis. Great stuff. So we've got the protein bit. So we've fueled up the movement bit. I'm always kind of drawn to that one because um, having an aura ring, which I have here, which tells me very, very clearly what my calorie target is for the day in terms of movement. Um, and I can choose lots of different ways of doing that sort of yard work is one of the popular ones on my agenda right now. Uh, but also then I've got the cycling and the walking and the surfing and all the other kind of stuff that I get involved in. And I can then basically count those calories. Is, is that what we're talking about? Is it that balance between intake and output? Um, or is there different sort of other movement that needs to come into the mix there? No, I love that. Yeah, that's exactly it. What is the what are you bringing in? And then do you have the same amount of expenditures every day? Um, and there could be a net delta, um, but like having an understanding of what that looks like. Um, the one thing that we focus on in particular is just building lean muscle mass um, where that's extended to whatever age you're in, because you can always build lean muscle mass, but building that lean muscle mass with that protein intake and that nutrition. Um, so that's like conscious movement. But then like, yeah, the playful movements, the hobby movements, the being the forever athlete, cycling, surfing. Um, I play basketball uh, and do you know, a couple of other things as well, uh, mainly lift and play basketball though, or like what, what my, my main things are, um, that I like keep being, staying active with, but how do, how, what is that movement look like? And then I do functional training too, which is essentially a form of working out, but, um, we do, I do a lot of kettlebell work. And so what does that look like though, in terms of movement, you know, that daily movement instead of things being sedentary, and so one thing that I love about movement, though, is that it's really understanding your body. What you have with the aura ring is two different type of movements, right? So your body has rhythms through the night and then it has rhythms through the day. And that's what people don't understand. Usually you have your circadian rhythm at night and then you're over your ultradian rhythms during the day. And so your circadian rhythm is balancing out. You're going through your stages of sleep, which your aura ring is measuring. And then your altradian rhythms are in a wakeful state. But if you're sedentary, then of course you're not getting the expenditures and then you're likely consuming. Um, and what people don't realize is actually, this is actually a funny statistic. I'll actually go on a rabbit trail just for a second. Um, they gain majority of their weight in November and December. Why? Because they can't stop grabbing the cookies, grabbing you know the extra piece of pie, all those things. So actually not much even if you're like relatively like sedentary but you move a decent amount through the summertime um through whenever it's usually those months that catch up to you that you're like ah this happened but then you're not, you're also not maintaining that level of same expenditure to like lose weight so they, they just accrue over a couple of years and that's when you realize dang i i've put i packed on you know, 25 pounds over the past few years. How did that happen? Well, it would probably happen in November, December, more likely. And so anyways, going back with movement, though, you have the altradian rhythms, which are like essentially they work in 90 minute stints. Our mind is not really meant to work longer than 90 minutes without like a shorter brief break. Right. Meaning 10 or 15 minutes of mindless work to come back to our certain task. So that just refreshes our brain and cleanses us. So anyways, that movement piece is so critical to even happen throughout the day, right? Getting around, moving, um, even if you're at your computer a lot, which I am, you know, I'm on the computer, I'm, 
I'm ch- talking with people all the time. Um, I do intentionally go to the gym. So that's my form of movement. But even if you can't do that, it's like, how are you moving throughout the day that just has some level of movement and activity in it uh, where there isn't just a straight like maybe three to four hours of sitting where you're on your phone? I'll get up uh, even because I, I like getting my steps in. I'm very like achievable oriented. I like I want to I want to achieve. And so I like getting more steps in. So one of the things is that, like I stack things. But if I'm if I'm talking to you, I'm probably going to be picking up my feet a little bit and just like bobbing around because I like those, that steps, that's movement, right? My body's moving instead of something sedentary where I'm just like sitting here and there's not as much exposure or expenditure. Um, that's the same thing. You're, you know, sitting down, maybe you're waiting at the doctor's office or something like that. It's like, you know, sometimes you just stand up and kind of walk around. You might look a little weird. I look weird all the time. Uh, but just those small things is that that's, that is what propels movement. Um, so movement, it just, it's such a critical piece to human life and then human longevity. And that we always say health span versus lifespan. Mm, that's a great phrase as well. And I think it, again, just keeps us all focused, doesn't it? Really? We can beat ourselves up about that unknown of how long we're going to live, but we know how healthy we can live. And it starts today, doesn't it? Or interestingly, with the third one tonight, because sleep is the third one on, on the list here. Um, is it the eight hours? I mean, there's been so much research over the decades saying always oh, eight hours sleep. Is that for everybody? You know, so it depends. The The body psychology is different. People just rhythm differently. The faster you can get into REM, you don't need eight hours. Like if you can get, but then you need to have a trackable and a measurable, such as the aura ring, the whoop band, something that measures those things um, of timing how much REM you're actually getting. So you need roughly around two hours of REM sleep and then roughly 45 minutes to maybe slightly over an hour of SWS sleep, which is your slow wave sleep. And so if you get those, you're you're likely going to be good. And if you can get those where you're going into REM and SWS um, within your first two hours of sleeping or the first like hour of sleeping, hey, you're doing really good. Um, but the reality is majority of people need over six hours of sleep every night. And the more you get seven to eight, the more your body recovers. Um, and the perfect analogy that somebody gave me one time, I was like, that, that's incredible. I'm going to keep using that, is that um, sleeping is like brushing your teeth for your brain. And so as you think throughout the day, just naturally plaque forms um, on your cerebral cortex and, and it just needs to be chugged away. And so the, uh, th- there's a spinal fluid that's actually released when you sleep, when you fall into REM and SWS. And when that spinal fluid is released, it starts chugging at the plaque on the brain. Well, if you can give it a longer window to chug away at all that plaque, you're going to feel up or ref- feel refreshed. You're going to feel, you're going to feel re- feeling really good on a day to day basis rather than I don't brush my teeth for four days in a row plaque starts forming on my teeth. They're getting gritty. You know what I mean? We don't see that in our brain, but that's actually what's happening in our brain. And so like, how are we protecting our brain for the, again, we go back to the purposes of longevity and that's a sleep is the narrative. Like, am I getting adequate sleep for the purposes of like, yeah, I want to feel good, really good. Or, or do I want to like slow down my metabolism and all these other detrimental effects that happens with, uh, you know, inadequate sleep. And then, you know, I've gained 20 pounds, my body's inflamed and now I'm in my forties and I'm like still trying to figure things out. My sleep habits are all over the place. And so those are the things that, you know, sleep it is, it is really imperative. Um, baseline, you know, I, I would hate to even say it, but baseline is minimum of six hours for, I would say 98 to 99% of all people. And then, um, you know, seven to eight hours is really, is really critical. If you can get, heck, if you can get a little bit more, by all means, get more, you're only improving yourself. But the reality is, is like eight hours is usually sufficient where you can wake up and feel really, really, um, cleansed. 
Mm, and I guess that is the point, isn't it? Because then when you do wake up, it's a physical cleansing, but then it's into the sixth, uh, sorry, the fourth pillar, which is mind. Because if you wake up in a, a non-cleansed sense at the, at the beginning of the day, you're going to be in reactive or defensive mode, aren't you, throughout the day if, from a mind perspective. So once you've, I guess, obviously had that uh, amount of quality sleep, because not all sleep is equal, what, what then is the pillar? What's the key tip then for, for the mind as we then kind of enter the next day? Yeah, the mind is, and you're so spot on if you don't get the sleep, then what does, how does that influence your mind? Right. And there's likely, you're going to likely make look, worse choices. Uh, it could be a food choice because you're like, eh, I didn't sleep that well. And yeah, I'll take this, but that really does happen. You're going to accelerate your decision fatigue because everyone starts the day with, you know, a clear brain. Right. And that's where you want to make your most important decisions. Well, as you make more decisions throughout that day, which we make a lot of decisions, especially with kids, I make a lot of decisions before 9 a.m. Um, and having a couple of businesses, then I get that decision fatigue. And so if I don't have an adequate night's sleep, I am absolutely going to have that decision fatigue. I'm probably going to make not as good of choices. I'm going to be like, ah, you know, the gym the gym can wait today. I didn't sleep all that well, you know, and that might roll over into the next day and the next day and the next day. And so usually worse decisions are made when you haven't had an adequate sleep. Um, so that's one reason why the mind is such a powerful tool. And then what are you feeding it is the next thing. And so with the mind is like that element of reading is just anything. It can be like fictional, non-fictional, but like I like the idea of both. Um, but like, what are you putting in your mind every day? So I've kind of have a system of, uh, I read a piece of scripture and then I read a book that's really going to put and fill my brain with, um, just a, a mindset that I need of positivity where, I, where I want things to go. Uh, usually where our mind tries to do is, is pull us back into the space of like the what ifs, but really i want to be pulling my brain and my capacity and my mind into a space of like well yeah what if, what if that does happen and so like that abundance type mentality and so how, what am i feeding my brain um and digesting that because no one's ever going to say like i want to be divorced in 10 years i want my kids to hate me and um you know i i want my company to go bankrupt like no one's ever going to say that right the reality is, is like, I, but, but they kind of do into their actions sometimes. Um, so then it becomes reversing that and, and re reverse engineering kind of with the mind of like what you're feeding it, like what books are you reading um, that ultimately are going to kind of fill your mind with the purposes of, okay, th yeah, that was good. I can take this nugget out and actually implement and do some action with that. Uh, this, the level of gratitude, that was one thing I had to go back to even with, like with my wife and my marriage is that I had a super negative attitude in my mid twenties. Um, and I had to, God who got hold of my heart. I had to reverse engineer that. And I, I think she would say, um, I don't think there's a day that doesn't go by that. I'm like, babe, I love you. And I genuinely appreciate you. And, uh, you're beautiful. And I just want to make sure those encouraging words because of the, 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 you know, the preservation and the protection of where I want my marriage to go instead of like, no, I want to be a divorce in 10 years. Um, like those are the things I want my actions to instill that and in positivity. So that's where the mind really comes in as far as how we're protecting our mind and how we're pushing the needle forward. Mm, I love that narrative and, you know, telling yourself the right story and significant others. It just, that creates the reality, doesn't it? It really does. And it kind of, you almost then you can't get distracted because no, I've, I've set the intention. I'm acting it out. I'm getting the feedback from the other person. It's just, there's the reality. It's all there in front of you. So beautiful ability to be able to craft that. So, you know, thank you for sharing that. I think it's a really profound, but very simple thing that we can all do. And I guess that plays over into the, the fifth one, which is the work, because it is about prioritizing, isn't it? I mean, with the mind, you can prioritize where you let your mind go or where you um, guide it. But the same with work. I mean, we have so many choices, don't we? And often I think people, when they're not finding the right work-life balance is because they get over 
sort of committed or they don't prioritize what is important or most valuable in their work. Do, do you have any tips there for the, the work pillar? Yeah, I think, you know, as we were talking about earlier is like the work, the burners come in play. So like we have to really the seasonality of the expectations of like what we grab onto, what is necessary to grab onto um, too. And so there's always these pieces of people want to, hey, I think we should move. I think we should have a baby. I think we should, um, I think, I, you know, I should take this uh, promotion at work and I should do this, right? And, th but never taking the time to reflect, to evaluate the seasonality of in that. Um, of like, hey, maybe I shouldn't take the promotion now. Maybe I shouldn't put in for this promotion or uh, maybe we should delay having a kid. You know what I mean? That that could be something where you like put the burners on and you really understand the seasonality of like where things work out. And um, that even comes down to work. Right. There's the expectations of like I'm coming into a very busy season. Usually, you know whether or not like you're coming into a very busy season. The element of burnout when happens when those seasons never go away and you're just cycling through and cycling through and cycling through and then you're like all right if like i've had enough like i can't do anymore and so it's really understanding and work of like number one what is the how are you decompressing so like for me stepping into a season we're we're actually going through a startup right now and that's super super difficult and it gets super stressful but what I always, always set the expectations with is that I still need my physical health. Like that is not something I'm willing to sacrifice for the startup. And so because that's a decompression of stress that I can get off of my load, like when we're absorbing, we you know hire on new team members, um, there's a lot of ramp up involved, but I, I like, I'm, I can't be the person I am to the team if I don't, if, if I'm not working out, if I'm not um, controlling my design and mindset and doing these other things. And so that's one of the big things in terms of like the intention of like how we navigate and put on these burners is really to evaluate like that season of work. Um, am I stepping into a season of work? My wife, she's super, super smart. Um, and she could definitely do some like really big things but we've evaluated as a team in our household that like yeah you know her line of work right now is she's an attorney it, she doesn't need something super stressful we don't need to bring something else on into our house that's super stressful um she her work's perfect for her she does a phenomenal job she's a phenomenal attorney she works for the government but she doesn't need to, she doesn't need to go out and work, you know, 50, 60, 70 hours a week and then bring that stress back to the kids. And so we've just evaluated kind of like the ebbs and flows within the sacrifice of our marriage. Um, like we feel like that that's more important than, you know, any additional money that we could potentially make. And so uh, now your, your mind's definitely going to want to go the alternative direction of like, we can make all this money. Like, I'm going to go after the money that's with work, but like, does it, it, does it go within the balance of the cadence of your, your stress loads and what you're able to manage and, and how you, again, how you're thinking about longevity. And so when you really can pull those triggers and, or those turn on those burners, um, you really can see life through a different lens and a different perspective. And then that's where I really believe peace comes into play. Mm, and with peace, I guess it comes to our final pillar, which is spirit, because it, it, it's not the guiding principle, because I often sort of find that, you know, when there's a list and it's either spirit or soul or whatever other words, you know, kind of conjure up that kind of feeling of the, this kind of greater purpose or this higher sort of energy or however you want to describe it, it often is left to the last because that's the pinnacle. That's kind of where. I guess, gives us that ultimate reason for doing all of these things. Is that the same for you or am I misinterpreting that last pillar? No, you're spot on, Neil. It's, uh, that's exactly it. It's, you know, what is the driver um, that ultimately gives you that, that like, hey, I'm, 
I'm doing this for not just me. You know, we, I think I talked about it a little bit earlier in the podcast is like, you know, throughout life, it's like, we kind of come and we say, we kind of think, you know, it, this is about me, you know, this, I, I want it to be about me. Um, but truly the benefit of the greater is it, when you can, when you can detach from that, when you can really detach from the outcome of something and just say, Hey, this isn't about me. This is about somebody else. And so, um, that's really, I think what ultimately encompasses that, that element of that you're living for a greater purpose. And so one of the things that I've done, I sat down and written out, um, just a mission statement. We have a mission and a vision statement for, for our family as well. Um, but you know, mine is simply to empower, and encourage others so I can leave a positive generational legacy. And so that element of like, am I being an encourager on a daily basis? It's not about me. It's about somebody else. And then, and then how can we come in an act of service? And so for this, again, just it kind of, kind of comes back to the narrative of like how I view, um, from a biblical sense, just, that's the way I kind of like get my lens and the perception of, of life and morality is that like Jesus was a servant and he came to serve. And what I've seen is like, the more I serve, the better I feel, <laughs> the more I serve other people, the better I feel. And so that's really what I think, you know, that element of the spirit comes down to is like, if you're being spirit led, how are you serving other people in the capacity at which they need to be served to better themselves? Um, and that really ultimately fills your spirit. And it, you just feel amazing when you help other people um, with their calling or their purpose or whatever that might be. And so anyways, that's that's the point of really the spirit. And it does. It gives you that layer of peace um, that really, you know, surpasses really all understanding. So that's we, we definitely it's a, it's a critically, critically important piece and almost anchors out um, all of our pillars. Mm, it's such a great feeling isn't it and I think you know for me that kind of just it just feels like it puts a smile on your face you can't not feel good about that last one can you because yeah. it is the, it is the reason it is why we do what we do it is really why we're here so that's, yeah, that's a wonderful kind of bringing that whole kind of mix of forever athlete thinking and kind of philosophy together in a, in a you know, beautiful uh, sort of rounded sense it's very holistic this and i absolutely love um, yeah the work that you're doing matt how can people if they want to carry on the connection and hear more you've got a podcast you've got a whole bunch of other kind of stuff going on how best to connect with you yeah the uh check out our podcast it's the full field podcast we're on all platforms so you can pick uh which platform you wanted to check out an episode we're always talking about nerdy stuff getting really in the nerdy into uh just the human performance and human longevity uh we love that um i am on facebook and instagram mainly um so human.optimizer is uh the instagram handle and uh matthew just matthew tack um and we're there we have full fueled uh on on uh all pretty much all platforms as well so you can check us out at at full field uh, but that's pretty much it we have we have a link to fitness.fullfield.com um where we kind of have our membership sites built out uh for anyone that wants to activate uh and really you know level up their fitness game and their mindset and then overall nutrition uh so that's that's pretty much what i got going on um and uh it's a, it's been a lot of fun uh chatting with you neil Thanks so much. Yeah. No, you're very welcome. And really, uh, yeah, I just want to thank you for kind of highlighting, I guess, to all of us that the 85 year old self looking back, no matter where you are, what you're doing, what your starting point is, that's so, so powerful. And I think if everybody can just sort of leave with that feeling of like, OK, my 85 year old self, what would they be proud of? And it probably is take the next step and connect with Matt because you're going to get a lot of great guidance and advice. Matt, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much Thank for your time pleasure. today. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure as well.